So when Sarah and I were talking about coming to visit you, I realized that it was exactly 20 years since The Culture Clash was first published. Uh, the book came out in uh, 1996, and it's now 2016. So I thought it would be nice to take the opportunity to chat a little bit about the book, um, because it's had such an impact. Um, so one of the things that I was wondering is, what was the impetus for the book? Um, boy, I think at the time, it was sort of a, a, you know, a cry for outrage, an attempt to sort of prompt people into outrage about a very kind of mundane, daily uh, degree of sort of cruelty to animals, basically. There's another way to sort of put it. This happening um, for which there was not really, I think, any militancy. Um, there had been sort of, you know, some very good, good, solid efforts to promote positive training. Uh, but there hadn't really been bad cop yet. Um, and so I said, well, you know, let me have a go at, at that. Um, and also, I, the other thing was I wanted to sort of um, put out there kind of in the ether just the idea that the dogs have, they're, they're just trying to kind of make a living in the world. They're just trying to get through their days. Um, and they end up in animal shelters, and they end up dead, and they end up in backyards and so on. Um, and we've got all these, I think, pretty pernicious notions about them. And, and I was trying to just, you know, try and, I, I guess, sort of yell that a little bit. Because you, when you wrote this in 1996, do you think that there has been, like, any change in, in the dog training world oh, since cer then? Certainly, certainly. I, I think that things are, are both, you know, better and also frustratingly the same. But my guess, and I, I don't know, because nobody's actually done a survey of, okay, so how many people were training method X, Y, Z at this time and how many, our, certainly our impression is that there's a lot more now of positive training, there's a lot more effective positive training, um, but I think there are probably corners, and I think there are plenty of trainers who are operating kind of in, in local vacuums where, where they happen to live, they may be the only person who's positive, and so they may feel like nothing has changed, but I think in the greater percentage, I think the percentage is certain, certainly has shifted, but I think the only percentage that would be acceptable would be that nobody in 2016 would be electively strangling and digging prongs and electrically shocking dogs to train them when we really don't have to. Um, and so I think that uh, I worry that you know militancy is, is hopefully not going to evaporate. I don't think it's going to. I think there's always going to be some of us who say, wow, that's just so not okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of um, incremental change, there's definitely yeah. been incremental change, but what changes do you think still need to be made? Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's two big areas. One would be that these things need to be codified into law. Mm -hmm. That it yeah. needs to be that not just in some pockets of the UK or in Iceland or what have you, that it's illegal to electrically shock puppies uh, or it's illegal to strangle you know, dogs and string them up or helicopter them, etc. But that's everywhere, and it's something that sort of should be kind of self-evident. It shouldn't be a debate point. It shouldn't be that there are, um, you know, groups of people who can even remotely, effectively lobby that this is at all necessary or okay or morally defensible uh, or any of the arguments that they put forward. And that that has to happen. Uh, and the other thing that needs to happen, and these things may be have to happen in tandem, um, is that the people who are training without force, there needs to be. A, a more universal competence there. I think there are a lot, uh, you know, we, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves in, in recognizing that, okay, it's not okay to do this, but then we still need to get the job done. Um, you still need to resolve a lot of serious behavior problems. Um, and I, I worry that sometimes there are people who are very well-meaning, but they really don't know what they're doing. And so I think those things will help each other. The more there are competent trainers getting the job done, the more it'll be absolutely, you know, there'll be no place for force trainers. I, I'm not sure that, I know that one of the war cries of the positive is, even if a positive trainer is incompetent, they're better than a, a force trainer. And I think that's by and large true, but it's not a heck of a lot better, because if the dog doesn't get trained, mm -hmm. you could very well end up, you know, in a, with a very poor outcome. So if you had the chance to write the book again, to like start anew, yeah. uh, as of today, is there anything you would include or, or well, uh, as differently? You um, I think I probably would use some, I, I, I think I would probably use a more moderate tone. 
Um, certainly when I rewrote it, I, I tried to moderate the tone. I tried to improve the writing. Um, um, but part of me also says, boy, you know, I, yeah, I don't want to moderate it to the point where I become one of the, you know, the, the, uh, the yes people for, well, you know, there are these people who are doing these things to dogs, they just need education, we've got to treat them well, etc. I, I think there is certainly a huge population of people, certainly owners, who yeah. it, it, we've got to be kind to them. They don't know. They, they've, been, they've been abused by the dog training profession, we've not got our act together for, for decades. But I do think there's a, a fair amount of professionals who it's no longer a matter of education. The information is out there, it's been out there for yeah. decades. Um, they are very well aware, and, and rather than writing off um, this, this is no longer a movement, it's moving now more mainstream as fringy or as strident, etc., that they, you know, they, they need to sort of wake up in the morning and say, so given that there are now thousands of trainers worldwide getting the job done on a daily basis, all kinds of cases without any use of force whatsoever, and I'm using it on virtually a daily basis, you know, what's going on there? That, that's not okay. And I think that the longer we enable that by saying, well, you know, we don't want to offend them, we don't want to use strident language, we don't want to call them out and say, what you're doing is absolutely morally unacceptable, ethically unacceptable, I think that, that, that you know, we're, we're, you know, we're relegating a lot of dogs to some pretty sick treatment. So I do think that, we, you know, so part of me wants to, I worry about the over-moderation of tone in our movement. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. we can be civilized and I think we can give people tools, but we do also have to recognize that, that it's not just a matter of education. People are, are electing to not retool themselves. And what do we do with people who are committing those kinds of acts in our society? We do, we want to recognize they're humans and they're fallible, etc. but we also want to say, not you're a bad person, but what you're doing is not okay. Right. And not to sugarcoat that at all. What they're doing is not okay. Uh, and I, I think the more that we can be as one voice there, and I worry that there's been a certain amount of fragmentation of that in our efforts to backpedal and not be, you know, and have the, the, the it thrown in our face. Well, you're being a hypocrite because you're being positive with dogs, but you're not being positive mm -hmm. with these people. Ha ha, gotcha. No, as a matter of fact, what you're doing is not okay. Uh, and, and it just isn't. And, and, and I think that needs to be said, and I worry that not enough of us are continuing to say that without any equivocation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, for me, one of the things that was so powerful about the book was that the words do pack a punch. It does make you sit up and pay attention. And I, I think um, that, that that is the impact on a lot of people. That it's like, whoa, okay. Hmm, I need to really think about this now because this is actually, it makes sense. And, the, and, yeah. it's, and it's necessarily going to be offensive to people who find, I mean, uh, of course people are going to find that kind of tone offensive. And of course some people are going to say it's not okay to, to, to say that, you know, what these people are doing is sick or wrong. Um, but, um, you know, the alternative is, you know, uh, if we just, if we just sort of say, well, you know, this is how I train, how everybody trains, it's okay, and we dilute that message, um, you are, you know, the people who are, who are electing to, to not get into the, the fray, um, are, the, is it, is it in their heart that they think that this is okay to do? Do they think that these people are using this as a last resort, or do we think that a good many of these people are not using it as a last resort? Um, and what about the many, many thousands of trainers who are doing similar case types daily and not having to resort mm -hmm. to that? So what does this tell us? Right. It tells us it's elective, it tells us that it's practitioner correlated, um, and so the practitioners that are doing it, um, you know, it, it, I, I do think that it's possible to separate the actor from the act. People say, well, you know, you're saying this person is a bad person. No, I, I have no idea about their, the other content of their character, but I do know that what they're doing here is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go down fighting on, I'll die on that mountain, that what they're doing is not okay. Um, and, and when that message gets fuzzed up, I don't think we're, we're advancing the router at all. Um, we, we need to go after the practice, um, which, you know, it's, it's illegal, it's wrong, it's unacceptable, it's not okay to do that. Um, and, and I think doing that is not, it's, that's not, uh, that's not an ad hominem attack, that is saying that it's uh, not okay to electrically shock dogs. Uh, there's not a circumstance where I think it's okay to electrically shock a dog. And it's so um, interesting because one of the, the arguments that we often get is, um, well, you know, science doesn't matter. 
Um, and I don't, or, or, oh, you talk too much about science. I, you know, I don't think you have to know a whole lot about science to know that electric, right. running an electric yeah. current through a dog yeah. is going to be painful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I certainly think if you're going to take people's money in for hire and you're going to go in and, and modify behavior, it's what you do need to understand. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you've got to be, be skillful at your job. But I don't think as a whole, society as a whole, needs to have a, a an encyclopedic right. understanding of animal learning or of dog behavior or anything to recognize that they're you know they're on they're on very shaky moral ground. Mm -hmm. It just that's just how it is. Yeah. yeah, and then there's the trainers that um, will say that you can't treat an aggressive dog using positive reinforcement. Like that, that they Incorrect. need. I mean, yeah. but those oh, are the ones. heavy hand thing. Yeah. Yes, and you get that with in pit bulls. Which yeah. is this breed needs a heavy hand, or this disorder needs a heavy yeah. hand. Just, it, it's just patently incorrect. I, mean, I, I recently read something, uh, a thread where somebody referred to um, their pit bull as a power breed. And you know, if, it, if oh. it wasn't so sad because of yeah. what happens as a result mm -hmm. of thinking my dog is a power breed and therefore needs yeah. a heavier yeah. hand, yeah. I would have laughed because yeah. you know I work in an animal shelter where I'm there's always pit bulls. I own a pit bull. Yeah. Um, I volunteered in a shelter where the majority of the dogs are pit bulls. I've never once had to. It's also been tried and failed. I yeah. mean, I like a lot of the people who are leveling that because they're they're fighting for their lives. They are, they prefer to train that way, um, and they're saying that well, you know, the dogs are going to shelters because of the positive training movement. They forget that a lot of us were in the game long before right. there was positive training. Right. 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 I was in yeah. shelter. I was at the Montreal SPC in the in the eighties. Um, and guess what? You know, there was plenty of dogs coming in, and they were absolutely being trained with all manner of reverses, and their outcomes were horrific. They were terrible when they were ending up doing first. So to say that they've not had their kick in the can is, is disingenuous at best. You know, they have tried it, and they're, they, they're, they're not getting the job done. Um, and we are, at least those of us who are competent, and, and, uh, and I think that, that it, it, we let them use that rallying cry of, well, you know, positive reinforcement is, is, is not getting the job done in, in ending up sending dogs to shelters, sending dogs to backyards, or getting dogs killed. Um, that we need to say, wait a second, that's just not, not true. Um, guess what? You, you be doing that. Yeah. Um, get, let, let's, have, let's give us a chance. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, they, they tried, you've tried, you've tried, you've tried yeah. and failed. Yeah. Um, it's just not, not, you know, but but they get away with that kind of argument because people don't call them on it. Yeah, and the other thing I think they miss, the people that haven't had a um, science education in animal learning, they don't understand that a lot of aggression is actually fear. Yes, right? And that's right. To treat fear it's with pain. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dog was spiteful, right? Mm -hmm. The yeah. dog was stubborn. Mm -hmm. um, you mean, think about what stubborn means. Stubborn means the dog knows exactly what you want. He's motivated to do so, but on so because of some sort of principle. Of or he's on a power trip. Yeah, yeah. he's not going to do something that's kind of in his interest. So I know that's reinforced behavior. It, it just doesn't even add up. Yeah. Um, I think that it's really a nice example of projection of kind of you know, human motivation to dogs. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the most powerful sections of the book the section on the Gorns. Um, do you remember how you came up with that? I've seen it used in so many blogs yeah. and posts, and well, um, it's really powerful for a lot of people. Well, uh, originally it was when I was working um, at the SBC in Montreal and seeing um, dogs brought in, and sort of just seeing the, how we, you know, kind of we, sort of human society as a whole had failed them, that they were born, and people had, had just made every possible error in how they treated them, how they interpreted their behavior, um, and, and the dog was then taken for a car ride. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the first image I have was, you know, I, I'd often be getting out of the, the car to, to, to come to work, be in the parking lot of the SPCA, and, and a relinquisher would be getting out of the car, and the dog would be going, yay, car ride, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and, and then taken into the building and handed to the, the worker, um, and the dog would, Become bewildered, frightened, uh, and then be taken into. At that time, it was a very crowded, busy shelter with a very high euthanasia rate, and put in a kennel. So it's a dog who lived his life in a house, um, and however badly the owners had treated him, however behavior problem had you know resulted in relinquishment or just 
because there was no time or the other human reasons that people relinquish dogs. From this dog's point of view, suddenly he was basically in, in the, the gulag, mm -hmm. um, you know, and forced to eliminate in his, his kennel, um, and then basically taken, manhandled by strangers down the hall, held down on the table, and killed. Um, and the reason for that was that he had barked um, or had argued with a person um, or had, you know, the, the kinds of things that if it was a human, that we would be basically executing people for arguing, we'd be executing people for picking up glasses of wine, for sitting in chairs, for doing all these things that, that, that and we never bothered to explain to the dog mm -hmm. that what you're doing is going to get you killed and that, that we do have the capacity to do that, but we've got to tool ourselves, we've got to, you know, get better at that. Uh, and that, that, that failure and the, the sheer numbers of dogs to whom that was happening, that I think you know, we, we need to do better. And, and we need to start empathizing with dogs mm -hmm. rather than seeing them as sort of our, our adversaries, that mm -hmm. somehow they're, you know, it's us versus them and we're all vying for some sort of mythical top spot. The dog has absolutely yeah. no idea what he's, what he's supposed to be doing. He's just acting like a dog mm -hmm. and, and, and that we can, we can do better. And the first thing to get people to do better is to get them to empathize and recognize just what that must be like to live in a culture where every single thing that you are programmed to do is a problem for the, for the species with all the power. They, they urinate, they defecate, and they, they growl, and they, they, this is what they do. And we, we claim to love dogs, and yet every single thing that they do that's in their ethogram is, you know, check them all off. It's like problem, 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 ooh, executable offense, capital offense, that one. Terrible, no, we're going to shock you for that. And nobody's saying that we're just going to let dogs bite people and, and do anything they want, but I think we can meet them part way and say, you know, there's a time and place where we're going to let you be a dog. And most of the time, dogs pull their punches. It's non injurious. They give us all sorts of signs to yeah. say that they're uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and yet, so many people don't know what they are. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I mean, I think we can do a lot better with body language education, which I think also mm -hmm. will go a long ways to helping people. Body language literacy, I think, would help a lot of people opt out of the the more ferocious training techniques because they're going to say, "Wow, you know what? Um, no, you're not. You know, you're not just. He's not trying to be bossy. You're, you're scaring him. Stop scaring mm -hmm. my dog." Um, I think you know. There's at some point somebody's going to lawyer up and say, "Why wasn't I told I could do this with chicken?" Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I was not told of alternatives, and you proceeded to do the most invasive, most harmful technique. Veterinary behaviorists and competent trainers are all on record saying this is dangerous, pernicious, side effect laden, and yet you did it, and I was not told. You told me that, that I had to do it this way. Um, it's incredible that dog trainers, the being competent ones, get a pass for this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the one thing that you hope um, readers of the culture class come away with? I, I, hope, they, I hope they come away with just a, just a little bit of fire in their bellies, a little bit of of wanting to advocate for dogs. Um, not just, well, I'm going to do my best to train this, but also say, wow, you know, the, the, what about the dog down the street who happens to, to you know, be in the, the radius of the force trainer? Do, do we owe him anything? Um, and, and can you find your way to, to, can we find our way to having a unified voice of saying, that's not okay, and, and we need to be a little more uh, aggressive about making these practices illegal, stop with the equivocation, um, and no, they're not bad people, no, they're not demons, but what they're doing is not acceptable, and they you know, that make this stuff illegal. Um, and, and I'm hoping that people will become a little, just a little bit more militant. Did you have any idea that the book would have this last year? I don't know. No, at the time, at the time, I, I, I'm not sure that it was, would be published at all. Partly because of the tone, and partly, I mean, I, I was not known um, in the, the community of people who were striving for change that it would be, a, you know, a, a rallying cry for them. Um, I didn't think that it would, you know, get any, any, not much following. Um, it, 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 both of the people who said, "Yeah, th thanks for, thanks for saying that." And, and people who decided that, you know, I was demonic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so does, it, does it still surprise you at how much of an impact it's had? Uh, I, I mean, do you I ever sit back and say, yeah. wow, I wrote this thing when I was pretty young. Yeah, yeah. And 20 years later, people are, I mean, yeah. I have, you know, comments yeah. from academy students and grads yeah. who are just, you know, like, 
That book changed the trajectory of their yeah. life. If it's helped them find the courage of their convictions or helped them clarify their own stance, mm -hmm. philosophical stance, um, or given them many technical inquiries, that is enormously yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So what is driving these people? I mean, these people are not, mm -hmm. not, not different species from you and me. Um, and they're aware now, this is 2016, they're aware that they're alternatives. And, and yeah. so what is making them not do it? And, and that's an interesting mm -hmm. question from just an anthropological or a human psychology perspective. What's driving it? What's making them elect? And, and how are they dressing up? So if they choose to dress it up in the language of dominance, if they choose to dress it up in the language of, well, I've got this last resort because you're, you know, you're slaughterhouse, whatever rhetoric they use, however absurd, it, that, that doesn't erase the fact that they're still electing this and then there's a puzzle there for, mm -hmm. you know, for psychologists yeah. or for a social worker to sort of say, okay, so what, what's driving these people um, and, and can we get to the bottom of that? Because if they need help, if they need help in, you know, in some sort of form of support groups or if we can help them cross over, then that needs to happen. Um, and I think that's not mutually exclusive to saying what, what they're doing what you're is, doing is, is morally yeah. 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 It, yeah. It, It's not okay to do yeah. that. But can we help you because you're clearly fe feeling the need to do that? So it's kind of like the same discourse we have in a civil society about acts that we find to be abhorrent, or, and you know, uh, people abusing spouses or abusing children or, or being, um, you know, racist, uh, homophobic, uh, any one of a number of morally repugnant acts in our society that we can sort of say it's not okay to act on that. Yeah. Uh, but we can also say that that you know, how did you get that way? We, we want to help. People not mm -hmm. be that way. That those those can be those can both be happening. Um, we don't have to throw out and say, well, it's right. actually okay to do that because we don't want to be you know mean to these people. No, we, I don't want to be mean, but we do want to say what you're doing is wrong. But how can we help you? But, we, but we've got to take it seriously on yeah. both scores. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. in any other industry, um, people that were using techniques that were so um, out of date, yeah, they wouldn't be able to practice. Right. And no, yet they were able to. That's right. Training. That's right. That's like. Yes. So frustrating. Yeah, like if you went to the doctor and they tried to give you ether That's right. to knock you out. Right. Like, what is right. happening right. Or, or if somebody abuses their spouse, if somebody strikes their spouse, assaults their spouse, uh, you know, there, there, there are going to be legal ramifications for that person. And we also are going to agree that that's morally indefensible. We're also going to get that person help. Mm -hmm. and we're going to recognize that person that person was born and they didn't ask to be dealt the hand of either genetics or environment that made them that way. And I think that we have to approach the dog training question the same way. Um, but I, I think I worry that sometimes that we get muddled on, you know, what does that all mean? Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I think we lose the message that, that it's not okay to do that. And I think that, that even if we get, I think, a little more pointed about just not okay to do that, that might even drive more quickly um, an effort to to unpack these people and, and figure out why in 2016, in light of the fact that you absolutely do not have to do it at all, that you are doing it daily. Well, given where the industry is now, what is it that you're most hopeful about? Uh, I think I'm most hopeful about young the young trainers um, who are coming up in the industry. You know, I'm, I'm an old timer, and way back in the day, there was some truth to the cliche that dog trainers were a little bit misanthropic and tended to gravitate because they were, you know, not particularly people oriented. And I think the new breed, certainly we see among our students, yeah. is their soft skills, they really like people, they, they want to modify human behavior incrementally, carefully, they want to do so respectfully, they want counseling chops, they enjoy that part of the equation as much as they enjoy dogs, and they've got the passion for dogs, um, and they've got structured education to help them get there. Um, and that the, the way we see them sort of soar, that, that future, that's what makes me yeah. tremendous hope that, that the, the future is very bright. I think there's some a stunning you know, talent yeah. on the horizon. Yeah. I think we try very hard to give them a very soft landing spot in a culture yes. and, a, and a crucible in which to grow, develop, have like minds. Because in the old days, you know, this is pre-internet, pre of course, you know, uh, that you know, dog trainers used to be kind of in silos. You know, it would be you and whoever was local to you, you grew right. your own assistants, and you know, and there wasn't the, the broader community. Yeah, so, yeah. and I, I love that now it's much more collegial, much more supportive, and, and, and I think that's a very, very rosy development. I love the yeah. community that we have. Yeah, we have, oh. we have, we have yeah. it's quite a nice culture. 
Yeah. Right. So it is actually yeah. a culture. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's a culture in which we zealously treat. Yeah. Right. We treat, <laughs> we treat yeah. each other decently. We treat yeah. clients decently. Yeah. 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 Um, Standard of excellence, and but recognizing that you know this is something complex. We're trying to get people to do. Right. Which is, yeah. You know, treat all kinds of behavior problems and counsel effectively, and that you've got to develop the talent carefully. Yeah. So what keeps you up at night? I worry about the infighting and dog training. I worry a little bit about the um, the. the Competence gap that I think our ethics are ahead of our competence. Um, uh, I worry sometimes about the, the phobia we still have with medication. That I think sometimes that can be a very powerful ally for certain disorders. Uh, yeah. Separation anxiety is a classic example. But there are others. Um, I, I worry um, about. I worry about the culture as a whole. But the, the the I think we were talking even recently about the, the post factual world. Mm -hmm. That you know that that, some, that there's an anti science bias. That you know right. this Donald Trump world of just say anything, nobody's going to call you on it, and if you just say the opposite tomorrow, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, nobody's going to call you, uh, there's a disdain for science. That's worrisome. Um, uh, yeah, the dog whisperer is still on TV, this is 2016, mm -hmm. yeah. still on TV. And I worry also about dog training and burnout. I think as much as we have locally, certainly the academy, created a, a community to support our people, I think as a whole, the, between the infighting, the culture wars, the confidence gaps of people are out there doing their jobs, without knowing what they're doing, um, a certain amount of infighting in dog training and so on, that good dog trainers, with the good talent is going to burn out because um, it's not an easy thing what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that worries me. Uh, I, see, yeah, I see so many dog trainers burn out that, that uh, I, think, I think we need to address as a whole the question of dog trainer burnout, mm -hmm. um, that that needs to be in front of our mind. What, what good is it to have all this talent? Um, you know, uh, and then have them, you know, last for a few years and then say, you know what, I, you know, I can't do this anymore. Okay, thanks for <laughs> having this chat because I really, um, I think that um, this is a book that stands the test of time, will continue yeah. to stand the test of time, and is probably um, one of the, if not, because, you know, you read a lot of people who say, you know, it's number one on my list, um, that has changed Oh, oh, yeah. The lives of literally millions of dogs. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, you guys yeah. are awesome. Come on, we don't love this. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> now, serious drinking begins. These are no longer props. Yeah. <laughs>